Well, a couple weeks ago, I visited Salit Hudson. Salit is one of our elderly members who is um, at an assisted living place in Vider. And Salit has fallen on some hard times. Um, she doesn't have a home anymore, and most likely she is going to become a permanent resident at an assisted living place. And so as we were visiting with one another, she remarked that this is not how she imagined the latter days of her life going. She, she said, you know those commercials about the, the elderly couple that are like in their twilight years and they're skipping along the beach together? She said, that's how I imagined that the end of my life would be. I didn't imagine that it would be anything like this. And then she asked me a tough question. She asked, is this part of God's plan for my life? It was a question of how God's will works. Did God will for me to live my life in this way? And I was quiet for a while <laughs> because I didn't know how to answer her. And finally, I, I, I spoke up and I told her this. I told her that I don't believe that God has one specific plan for our life. I don't believe that God's will is like a path. Have y'all ever heard people describe God's will as a path? Sometimes we imagine that His will is just this one pathway or this one road that we're forced to walk down. And when you look at God's will that way, it means that everything that happens to you in life, absolutely everything that you go through was predetermined and pre-planned by God. Like from the very beginning of time, before anything existed, God planned for your life to go exactly in the way it's going from the beginning of time. Good or bad or right or wrong, or evil, sinful, everything, it doesn't matter. God planned it. God planned this one path for you, and that's it. Live with your lot. And for someone in Salit's position, that's really hard to believe right now. She's really struggling with the idea that God would pre-plan the way her life has ended up and that's it. So is there an alternative, though? <laughs> if you don't like the path analogy, what's the alternative? The answer is yes, there is an alternative. Instead of a path, you know what? I like to imagine God's will for our lives more like a paint-by-numbers picture. Do you all know those paint-by-numbers picture, what I mean? There, there's, Jeff pulled up a few images for us this morning. In a paint by numbers picture, there is one number matching one color. For example, one could be red, right? One is red. And everywhere you see the number one on this picture, you're supposed to paint it red, no matter what. And you know what? There are moments in life when God wants us to do something very specific with our lives. There are moments in life where God wants us to paint all the number ones red. Like you don't have another choice. If you want to be in God's will, paint one red. But these are things that we, they're things that we know God is calling us to do no matter what. Anywhere you wind up in life, God will, God's will for you is to absolutely do those things. But here's the thing about those things. They're not hidden things. I don't think it's some hidden will that you have to figure out. Those things where God is saying, absolutely do this, they're not obscured in any way. I think that they're explicit in Scripture. If you want to know what God's will for your life is, it's explicitly laid out on the pages of Scripture. It's things like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Or it's things like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those two things. Absolutely that's God's will for your life, that you would love the Lord with all your heart, that you would love your neighbor as yourself. It's those kind of things. Anywhere you go, that, 
you can count on it. Anywhere you go, one is red. Paint those things there. But occasionally on this paint by numbers picture, we also come across maybe a portion of that picture that doesn't have any number at all. Like maybe there's portions of this picture that don't have a coordinating number and color. There are instances in life where God does not have one specific action or one specific decision in mind for us. Rather, at these moments, God wants us to use our knowledge, our talents, our gifts, the particulars of our life to paint something beautiful for Him. You decide, God says. You decide. Use any color you want and paint me something beautiful with your life, with everything I've given you. And what all that means is, it may not matter so much, it may not matter so much who you marry in life. Like that matters, right? That, it matters a lot that we pick the right people, but... But I think I might have wound up at a different college somewhere. And I might have met another girl that made me just as happy as Amy. And that I could have married this girl and guess what? Still been in God's will for my life. It, it means that it may not matter so much what college you go to or went to. I hear teenagers, seniors in high school just worrying, worrying, worrying. They get five offers from five different colleges, and they're like, I don't know what's God's will for my life. And I'm like, maybe any of them. Maybe any of them. And no matter what college you go to, you can still live God's will there at that college. Or, or it's things like what job you work or, or, or what town you live in that maybe there's some areas of our lives where God doesn't have a specific number to paint a specific Color in a variety of places or settings, you could still choose to live in God's will or not. You could still be in God's will in a multitude of settings, even when, even when you find yourself in a setting of life that's less than desirable. It's not a secret. God's will for your life you want to know God's will for your life? What does God want me to do? Where does He want me to go? I'll tell you, it's not a secret. God wants you to live like Jesus everywhere you go and anywhere you go. It may not matter so much what specific destination you go to or what specific setting in life you wind up in. I know God's will for you. Live like Jesus there. It's that simple. God's will for your life is to live like Jesus every where you go. So that was my challenge to Salith that day. That was my challenge, that God may not have planned this specific thing for your life. God may not have planned for you to wind up in an assisted living place that you don't like very much. But, however, she could still choose to be in God's will, even in a place like that. And it's true for everyone it's also, I think, the lesson that we learn from Scripture, specifically in the story of a man named Stephen in the book of Acts. So we're in Acts, of course, going through our series through Acts. And remember, we're studying the characters in the book of Acts. Last week we did Peter. We talked about what kind of man Peter was today. We're going to talk about Stephen. And Stephen was the very first martyr of the church. We're going to skip around a little bit in Stephen's story. We're going to start in Acts chapter 6, and read verses 8 through 15, and then we're going to skip over to chapter 7. So let's start in Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the prov provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, <laughs> but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen 
speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And then go to chapter 7, to the very end, in verse 54. Acts chapter 7, verse 54. Stephen gives a big speech in between all of this. It's the longest speech in the book of Acts. It's also considered by many one of the most important speeches in the book of Acts. But here's the result of Stephen's speech. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. It's the martyrdom of Stephen, the very first martyr of the church. And from that day on, there began a terrible persecution of the early church. Stephen's death kicked it all off. But here's what I think we learned from Stephen's story. Just like Stephen, when life isn't going our way, we can remain in God's will if we will live and die like Jesus. We can remain in God's will if we choose to live and die like Jesus. That's the most interesting part of Stephen's story. Go back and look at all the similarities between Stephen's death and Jesus' death. Luke tied them in together. Stephen imitates Jesus even during this whole death scene. Stephen's final days were very similar to Jesus' final days. Stephen's final days were also less than ideal. He was accused falsely of blasphemy, dragged before the Sanhedrin, and then killed illegally and unjustly by an angry Mob, it was enough discouragement to frustrate even the best of God's followers. And I think that if Stephen would have started to complain, started to question God here, we probably would have been more sympathetic to him. I think we would have sympathized with him. Stephen very easily could have said, you know what, this stinks. Life stinks right now. This is terrible. I've been faithful to Jesus. I'm a good person. I I do right more often than I do wrong. And I've done everything God has wanted me to do. I'm serving in the church. Golly, like this is how my life ends up. You know what? This stinks. And we probably would have related to Stephen. In fact, I think I would have related to Stephen a little bit more if he'd reacted that way than the way he actually reacts, but it's not what Stephen does. Even in a bad situation, even when he's been thrown a curveball, when everything in life doesn't seem to go his way at all, 
even to the bitter end of his life, to the very end of his life, Stephen chooses to be like Jesus. Even to the very end, he chooses to die like Jesus. More than that, Stephen lives like him to the very end. So first, what does Stephen do that's so similar to Jesus? Well, first, Stephen lives and dies believing that Jesus is Lord. Like he lives and dies believing it, that Jesus is Lord. In verse 55 it says, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, Look! He said, I have seen heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen believes with every fiber of his being that Jesus was Lord. And he doesn't waver. Right up until the very end, he doesn't say, you know what, all that Jesus stuff is made up. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Peter told me. Peter told me where they hid his body. I recant. Please don't kill me. He doesn't say that. He goes to his grave confessing belief in Jesus Christ. He says, I can see him sitting right next to the Father, just like he said he would be. Jesus is the Messiah. Kill me if you want to. I believe in Jesus. You know, one of the most inspiring examples of belief in church history was the martyrdom of an early church leader named Polycarp. Maybe some of you have heard the story of Polycarp before he was burned at the stake for his faith. He was an old man at the time. The aged Polycarp had been arrested by the Roman authorities and brought to the arena for execution in front of a cheering crowd. And the proconsul pressed him hard and said to him, Swear, and I will release you. Revile Christ. And Polycarp replied, famous reply, such a good statement. Polycarp said, Eighty And six years have I served him, and he never did me wrong. And how can I now blaspheme my king that saved me? And then they executed him. That's living. And that's dying like Jesus. You know, when Jesus is being interrogated by the Sanhedrin, towards the end of Jesus' own life, he's being interrogated. The high priest asks him, Are you the Messiah. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And here's what Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Did y'all see that? It's the same thing that Stephen said at the end of his life. One of the championing marks of true discipleship. Just just one of the highlights and the main goals of discipleship is genuine belief in Jesus as Lord, even in the darkest valleys of life, even in all those moments when in life when you question God or you question His will for you. No matter what, hold on to your confession of faith. That's true discipleship right there. In fact, the, the Apostle Paul proclaims in 2 Timothy chapter 4, that one of his greatest achievements in life, not not even one of his greatest achievements, his greatest achievement was, well, Timothy, you know that that I wrote over half of that New Testament, don't you? (laughs) Over half of those words, straight from the mouth of Paul. No, he doesn't say that. Nor does he say, I went on three missionary journeys, you know. How many did Peter go on? (laughs) No, he doesn't say any of that. Here's what Peter says at the end of his life. That his greatest achievement is that he kept the faith. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. You know, that's the goal of true discipleship right there. Just like Stephen, we can live and die like Jesus by holding fast to belief in Jesus Christ as Lord, all the way to the bitter end. Second, Stephen does this. Stephen lives and dies in trusting himself to God. From from the beginning to the end, Stephen lives and dies in trusting himself to God. Verse 59, he says, 
or it says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Commentator William Barclay reports that the way a stoning occurred at this time was actually pretty gruesome. A guilty person would, would actually be thrown off of a cliff, or they'd be thrown off of a hill or a high point, and if the fall killed them, then very well, good, the task was done. But if they didn't, people would gather on top of this hill or this high point, and they would throw stones off of the cliff on top of the person to finish them off. So I don't know exactly how they stoned Stephen, but we are left to imagine that that that's what they did to him. And we are left to imagine that Stephen didn't, or that he did survive the initial fall and then begins this prayer while these stones are being heaved upon him from the top of this cliff. That's pretty gross, isn't it? I mean, that's a, that's a gruesome way to die. And still in this horrible display, Stephen is entrusting his life to God. Like even with, with stones being heaved upon him, he's saying, Lord, receive my spirit. I trust you. In this moment of pure madness and despair, he gives his life to God. You know, trust is a valuable commodity. Our, our trust, to, to say to somebody, I trust you, that's valuable. We don't just give our trust to anyone or anything. The other day I was driving on I-10 and, and one of those Teslas passed me. You know what the Tesla is? Those self-driving cars? They, they drive themselves and the, the driver's supposed to be able just to sit back, type in his GPS and it, it'll take him straight there. You don't have to pat or you don't have to drive at all. And immediately I got scared when I saw the Tesla. <laughs> I started to move over as far as I could because I wondered, who's really driving that car? Like, is it, is it a person behind the wheel, or, or is, it this, is it the car? And I got nervous, and I moved over. But after that Tesla passed me, uh, we were driving down the road, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and I, and I saw Beckham and my four-year-old son, and he was just fast asleep, just fast asleep in his chair. He didn't have a care or concern in the world. And I just thought about the difference between a four-year-old sleeping in the back of the car and a Tesla. Beckham was completely confident that he would get home. So confident that he was snoring. And do you know what the difference is? The difference is in who's driving the car. That's the difference. When our father is the one driving, when our father is driving the car, then we can completely trust that he's going to get us home. That's the difference. That's living and dying like Jesus. Luke reports that on the cross, so the same thing Stephen does when he's being stoned to death, look at that. It's the same thing that Jesus does too. Luke says that Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Look at that. The exact same thing that Jesus did when he's dying, Stephen does. Entrusting yourself to God allowing the Father to drive the car, that's the only secure way of reaching home. Just like Stephen, we can live and we can die like Jesus by entrusting ourselves to God every single day of our lives, even to the very end. And lastly, Stephen lives and he dies like Jesus by forgiving those who persecute him. By forgiving those people that hurt him the very most. It's the very last thing that Stephen does. Take a look at verse 60. It says, Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. That's amazing, isn't it? Like That, that to me is just... Anytime I see an act of forgiveness in Scripture, it's amazing. I think this one in particular is amazing because of how unexpected that act of forgiveness is. Like, it's completely unexpected. Right at the moment when these people just absolutely do not deserve forgiveness. Like, in the very act of killing somebody, Stephen prays that God will not hold this sin 
against them. Unexpected forgiveness. It just, that's something else. You know, on October 2nd, 2006, you might remember this story. October 2nd, 2006, a man with a gun walked into an Amish schoolhouse. After the teacher fled to summon help, the man ordered that all the children lie down on the floor at the front of the class below the blackboard. He then allowed all the boys to leave and he shot all the girls before shooting himself to death. Five out of ten girls survived that horrible day and news traveled slowly in the community which shuns telephones, but families and friends soon started to gather around the schoolhouse that was now being examined by police and other investigators. Within hours, the Amish community proclaimed that they forgave the shooter. And many, including family members of those who lost their young children that day, went to visit the shooter's wife with food and words of consolation and forgiveness. In fact, if you get on YouTube, you can see lots of news stories about this. Lots of reporters rushed to this town because they were just, I mean, not only was it a, a mass shooting, but it was also this remarkable act of grace. And 10 years after the event, I mean, 10 years later, one newspaper wrote, there have been many mass shootings across America in the 10 years since the shooting in the tiny village of Nickel Mines, some with much higher death tolls, but the Amish school shooting still strikes a chord. The attacker preyed on the most innocent and defenseless members of a determinedly bucolic and pacifistic religious community. Within hours, the Amish announced they had forgiven him. The whole world came to know of grace and forgiveness because of the actions and attitudes of the Amish community. And over 10 years later, the impact is still not lost. Unexpected forgiveness. That's living. And that's dying like Jesus. And once again, Stephen's actions in his death mimic Jesus' actions in his death as well. From the cross, Luke reports, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Even in a moment when humanity deserves it the very least, or in a moment when we may feel justified by holding on to our grudge, or we may feel justified in holding on to our anger, the follower of Christ forgives. The follower of Christ forgives. Just like Stephen, we can live and die like Jesus by forgiving those who hurt us the very most at an unexpected moment. <laughs> so the secret to God's will? The secret is there is no secret. That's the answer. God's will for your life is to live like Jesus everywhere and anywhere you go. In all the highs and in all the lows, on the mountain, and in the valley, in the comfort of our own homes, or in an assisted living home, from A to Z, from the cradle to the grave, even at the very moment of death, we can still live like Jesus. We can believe with every fiber of our being that Jesus is Lord. And we can entrust ourselves to God even in the midst of suffering. And we can choose to forgive even those who are completely against us. That's living like Jesus. That's dying like Jesus. So after I talked with Salit that day, um, she had a look in her eye that she didn't have when I got there. I could see that her mind was thinking a little bit. She said, I've never thought about it like that before, and I really hope that she found it encouraging to her. Like, that's an encouraging thought to me, that maybe all these bad things we go through, God doesn't plan those for us, but we can still choose to be in God's will, even in all those bad times. That's encouraging to me, and I hope that she finds a new purpose 
for her life while she's there. Like maybe she still has opportunity to share Jesus with some people that really need it there. So I hope she finds new purpose. But you know, she might need a little help and encouragement from her church family. If some of you are willing to drop by and see her, I know she could use a friendly face. Some of you are willing to write her a card. I'll take them over to her. She may need a little, a little help from her church community to live like Jesus in this time of life. But I know that she can do it. And I know that you can do it too. A person can still live in God's will if they choose to live like Jesus no matter where they are living. Would you pray with me?